Welcome one, welcome all to the first and what we hope will be a series of interviews of members of Epiphany, Epiphany Anglican Church in Ottawa. Epiphany social media team thought that these interviews would be um, a good way to keep us all connected during these unprecedented times of social isolation that characterizes COVID-19. Our format is really simple. Our interviewer, Jillian Keane, will ask her guests a series of questions, the type of questions we'd ask the guest if we had the luxury of having coffee hour after service, like we all love to do. Um, if you go to Epiphany, you know Jillian. Jillian is one of the um, founding members of Epiphany and was a member of St. Christopher's before then. Her first guest today is Reverend Alana McCord, who is Epiphany's priest. I think Reverend Alana might be the first to say it's been a bit of a wild ride since she joined as curate about two years ago. Let's discover more about uh, Reverend Alana. Take it away, Jillian. Thanks, Judith. Alana, this is really fun to have the opportunity to talk with you like this. It's sort of like being a coffee hour. And I guess um, one of the first things that is always interesting to me when I hear about somebody and what they do for a living and things is um, just to know, have you always wanted to be a priest? Has it always been in your heart to be a priest or were there other um, occupations you considered before making that decision? Thank you for your question and thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be your first victim of um, interview subjects. <laughs> um, the answer, the short answer is no. Um, I wanted to be a vet when I was small uh, and then I came up against uh, the wall of uh, advanced mathematics and realized that, that I uh, wasn't the, the best at biology, yes, chemistry not so much, um, a lot of the sciences and mathematics. Um, and, uh, and then I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I thought about a lot of, of things which actually in retrospect contained aspects of, of ministry, um, teaching, um, counseling, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of working with people, certainly. I, I never, I never wanted to be the kind of person who, who worked entirely in isolation. I, I find that, um, lonely. Um, but then uh, after I, I graduated, I, my, I did my undergrad uh, in history uh, with a minor in drama. Uh, and when I finished, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought, I don't think I want to go back and do more university when I'm not quite sure what I want to, to focus on. Uh, so I took a couple of years off and I worked um, in a couple places, uh, but mostly, mostly a public library, which was awesome for someone who loves to read. Um, and then I started to think about, uh, about doing a degree in divinity. Uh, and it was in my first year that I realized that the reason why I couldn't figure out what it was I wanted to do was because it was supposed to be this. Okay. That's an interesting background from veterinary science to, uh, the ministry. I just but like animals. It's still caring. It's still a caring yeah. profession, right? So I got to I got to do the blessing of the animals this year. So there you go. It's perfect. Everything connects. <laughs> um, we so you shared with us that you're working on your PhD. What is your PhD? What is the subject of your PhD in, Alana? So uh, uh, what one usually has to come up with a soundbite version because people ask this question all the time, and I think I probably put it down on my parish profile, but I'll say it uh, uh, again what I, what I say when people ask. Uh, so, the cultural Christianity of First World War Britain and Canada, and the way in which people use that culture to frame the war experience. So, if a bunch of people have um, a lot of common narratives and stories and idioms and, and ways of expression, regardless of, of whether they have a personal faith, even, or if they're Christian. Um, because, of course, you know, say, say in Canada, um, and especially in, in the UK uh, at the time, uh, we, we have people from all faiths um, and cultures and, and, and so forth. But if there's sort of a general understanding of uh, the tropes contained in, in the Christian story. Uh, people would often use these to describe what is an indescribable experience. Uh, and that is, that is a common problem uh, in, with modern soldiers even, that you come back and you don't know how to describe it to anybody. 
because you've had this experience and they haven't. Uh, and so when people could use certain analogies um, in, a, in a newspaper article, in a poem, in a letter uh, to people, um, in, even to themselves and their journal entries and, and that sort of thing, they could assume that other people would understand the reference, as it were. Um, and I found that really intriguing. I've always been interested in the, in the First World War uh, and, and a lot of the aspects of it, especially the cultural aspects of it. I'm a cultural historian. Um, and so that was what I decided to, to write about. And since I haven't gotten sick of the subject yet, I guess I picked the right one. It's, that's really interesting. Now, if you were, had an opportunity to sit down and eat dinner with any of the people you've met through your um, study of, um, of the cultural aspects of the First World War, is there anybody you'd choose? Oh, you mean, you mean the people I'm researching? Yes, any of those people, when you've researched them, have you thought, oh, I'd love to sit down and have dinner with them or have a beer in a pub or anything like that? Is there anybody that encourages you that way? Um, sorry, you, you mean historical figures, right? Not like other historians or, because there's, there's different events. Either, okay. either. All right. Um, if, if I was going to talk to anybody of, of a fellow historian currently, it would probably be Jay Winter, who is who I've never met. Um, he, he's an American historian, a uh, cultural historian of the First World War. Um, and actually the, the, he was one of the historians um, behind a documentary, a, a multi-part series that was uh, done for PBS when I was in my mid-teens. And the thing that actually really launched my interest in the subject. So of course I'd love to meet him and pick his brains and, and that kind of thing, he, as much as I use a lot of his work uh, in my own uh, writing. Uh, but if I was picking someone from the period, um, then I think I would have to pick uh, my favorite war poet, who is uh, was uh, Siegfried Sassoon. Um, Sassoon was in his late 20s um, when the war broke out. Uh, he fought uh, in, in the war. He was a decorated officer. And then he decided uh, that he wasn't going to fight anymore, and he wrote a public protest. Uh, and what they decided to do with him, instead of shooting him, um, which, you know, you could for a desertion, um, they decided to have him committed to a mental hospital, oh. which, of course, effectively um, negates his, his attempt to protest. Um, and fortunately, they sent him um, to a, 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 an extremely enlightened place for the time because sometimes the treatments were pretty horrific. Um, a place that was more about what we would think modern um, types of, of um, psychological therapy. Um, and he was paired up with a doctor, um, Dr. Rivers, who, who was a perfect match um, for doctor and patient, which is really imperative when you're, when you're, having, uh, when you're having therapy. Uh, and uh, he was a most intriguing person, uh, Sassoon. Um, and he, he eventually went back um, for the rest of the war. Uh, yeah. And he survived it whereas other poets did not. And he would be a very interesting person to sit down perhaps towards the end of his life. Um, he died in the late 60s. Um, and, and, to, and to talk to him then, when a lot of people had already gone, whether they died in the war or afterwards, and, and to hear what he had to say. That's uh, because it's a person that you, you sort of don't, I mean, I've never heard his name before. So it's really interesting to hear about that journey for mm -hmm. him and how he was treated for sure that's very cool that's very cool um he, he's a, yeah he's a really interesting this is s a s s o o n sassoon and what nationality was he uh he was english um oh. but his mother her, his mother really loved wagner so that's why he's called siegfried oh okay yeah okay. uh but and and then his father's family were were um is iraqi jewish actually and had come wow. to england um, the previous century. So, so it was interesting because he had a real sense of other um, being, being um, part, partially Jewish and, and also he was gay. Okay. So it, it, he had like a really interesting sense of, of being part of something and not part of something because his mother was, was very much a, an established English Anglican family. So wow. uh, it would have been interesting to have dinner with them at their house, actually, <laughs> when you talk about them, it would have been nice to go to dinner at their house. Very it interesting. Would, it would indeed. There's yeah. a, yeah, there's a really, um, 
yeah, there, there's a great biography of him and all that. Anyway, yeah, I just, I like him a lot. I find him extremely intriguing and I love his poetry, so. Great, thank you. That was, that's very interesting actually to me. Um, so during, we're gonna take a big historical leap and say right. during the COVID lockdown, <laughs> which I'm sure he never anticipated would ever happen, um, you have been so generous with your sharing during evening prayer of your favorite um, books and movies and music. Um, what would you say, um, could you pinpoint one movie or one book that are definitely, that are close to your favorites or are there too many to mention or? Oh, that's so hard. That's so hard. Um, you know, I was, I was just talking to one of my best friends the other night and, and he and I were agreeing that, that we weren't always very good at finding the absolute favorite. And so we tended to, to subdivide, you know, my favorite action film my favorite romantic film, my favorite, you know what I mean? Like different, different categories that helps, then you can cheat and have as many <laughs> as you like. Um, you know, and this happened a lot when I was doing all those recommendations. And this is actually a proven fact. When, when a person is under a lot of stress, they tend to want the familiar, right? Whether that's the familiar mm. things to eat, familiar people in their lives, um, and familiar um, media that they're consuming. Uh, I have read a lot of, of remarks that people have made of, I went back and watched the show that I've already seen. Or, you know, and, and certainly that's true. My, all, a whole bunch of my friends are all uh, marathoning the Golden Girls, oh, uh, yes. <laughs> which they've seen before. And I recommended the Golden Girls back in the, in the summer. And I have been watching episodes too, because you, you just, you want something, you know how it's going to end. It's going to end well, that kind of thing. Um, when, I'm, when I'm under stress, I tend to reread um, books that I love. Uh, Jane Austen, a lot. Uh, fun fact, um, when during the Second World War, um, Winston Churchill was reading Pride and Prejudice uh, and remarked in his diary how amusing he found it that all these people are, are going around England during the Napoleonic Wars and they never mentioned the wars. How refreshing. <laughs> you know, um, and, and indeed, uh, in the First World War, people were reading a lot of, of that literature. They didn't want to read war literature when they were at the front. Um, I remember uh, one, one particular diary that I read in the Imperial War Museum of a chaplain um, talking about he was bivouacked in a stable on Christmas Eve. Oh. How, how meaningful, right? That's so very interesting. talked about that for a while. Yeah. yeah. He talked about that for a while, and then he he uh, he said how he, he closed off the night, you know, getting tucked into his bed with a copy of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, like, <laughs> you know. So um, I've been reading a lot of Jane Austen. Uh, it's really hard for me to say. I, I don't think I could say which Austen is my favorite. I really love um, Persuasion. I really love Northanger Abbey, uh, but they're all wonderful. Um, you know, movies. I I just uh, I, I was watching a lot of old favorites over Christmas. I must say. Um, and I've got plans actually for, for E.T., which I know I recommended uh, back in the summer. Uh, E.T. happens to be the first movie I ever saw in a movie theater. So uh, I have a lot of, of warm and fond memories of that too. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. So during COVID, what would you say um, are some of the random acts of kindness you have observed? Um, not just at Epiphany, but in your private life or observing on the street as you've walked by some somebody or anything like that. Have there been any that have stood out in your mind? I, I don't know if it's necessarily COVID related, but it certainly happens at the time um, when, when dad died. So he died on a Friday and um, and then I had, the, I had to sit on the weekend uh, doing not much. Um, I was making phone calls and all those kinds of things. But Monday morning, um, I had to start dealing with everything financial. Um, and, you know, I called TD Bank. And, of course, no one was picking up uh, because everybody was on the phone. You know, we were in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and so I gave up and I, I went to um, the only TD branch in this in general vicinity where I live, uh, which was open. Um, and I just walked in off the street with no appointment or anything. Um, and 
uh, the person uh, who, who ended up sitting down with me uh, to begin the process, who is still my guy when, when I have to, to deal with estate stuff. Uh, hello, Bruno from TD. Um, but he, you know, we had never met. There was no preamble. There was no appointment. Um, and he just made everything better. You know, everything was, it wasn't that big a deal. We could get it all settled. You know, these things that needed to happen right away could happen right away, you know, all these things. And I, I know that that almost certainly would have happened regardless uh, right. because that's his job, you know, and, and all that kind of thing. But he was, he was so kind and I was so anxious about getting this particular thing, this particular ball rolling. Um, especially too, because I didn't know if it was, if, you know, restrictions were going to get even more and I wouldn't be able to do anything. And it was just, you know, a, a, a handful of things that I really needed to, to do. And I slept much better after that day, you know, right. and I just, he, and he's continued to be fantastic uh, in this whole situation. And I've just really appreciated, it was exactly what I needed at the time. Yes, probably, he probably had no idea initially what a huge difference he made to you in that particular moment. No, it's and great. I thanked him, you know, for it, yeah. but it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's been wonderful. It's huge. It's huge. Um, mm -hmm. So the other thing I wanted to ask you is you've had, I guess, over two years. I didn't sort of realize the time until the last service, you said, this is my third epiphany and I'm going, wow. <laughs> in some ways it <laughs> yeah. seems like you've sort of been with us for such a long time and in others, it's gone very quickly, but I wanted to ask you what you thought um, was really some of the strengths of Epiphany as a parish and, and your experience within the parish and what you find some of the strength of the parish are. I mean, I think I've said this before um, more than once, but Epiphany is an incredibly friendly parish. And I mean, that's, that's sort of a given. I don't think that'll surprise anybody to hear. Um, and, and a lot of parishes are friendly, okay? But, um, but it's such a welcoming place. I know dad remarked on it. I remarked on it. You know, when you've been to a lot of churches and seen, um, you know, th there are times when um, a group of people are maybe not naturally, um, you know, extroverted and, and wanting to, to talk to strangers, but they, they're plainly making an effort. And that's great. I appreciate the effort and all that kind of thing. But it seems to me that the culture of the parish of Epiphany is naturally to be very friendly and very welcoming, you know, even to people who, who just walked in the door for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and that is an incredibly special thing. Um, it, and, it, and it affects everything else, right? It, it's, um, it, it, it creates a personality, a parish personality, um, which, which bleeds into every other aspect of it. Um, you know, it's not just, you know, that's great, you know, someone new off the street. It also means everybody who's here, you know, whenever there's a crisis, and we've seen that happen, we've seen that happen in the past year, um, but before that as well, um, you know, uh, you know, tragically, if, if we lose someone in the parish or, or if someone's having a difficulty or what have you, I have seen the way that the parish is banded together like a village, right, to help the person who is in need. And, and that is, again, just a wonderful, lovely thing uh, to observe. Um, it, it, and and it's, it's hard to make that happen if it's not the natural inclination of a group of people. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it can be extremely uncomfortable, it can be awkward, it can, you know, take a long time and all that kind of thing. Um, but neither is it overly pushy, I find. Sometimes mm -hmm. um, someone is, is sort of terrifying to the new people, <laughs> they, they sort of glom, glom onto them and, and you think, okay, back off, back off, back off. You know, um, but, but I don't, I don't find, like, people are sensitive at Epiphany to that sort of thing. I, I've seen, you know, the occasional person come in who's more of an introvert, and I've seen people be very, very friendly with them, but not, you know, not where you see them running out the door and they never come back, you know, right. um, that's a real gift. Yeah, I, I actually, it takes me back to a memory that I have of when we first moved to Ottawa and I was trying to find a church and a friend of mine went to a church in the West End, somebody that I'd known in Kingston where I came from. And um, so I went there and they were very pleasant and stuff and they said, oh, why don't you stay for coffee? And I did. But then 
my friend was there and she said, well, you know, she sings in the choir. Oh, I bet you're an alto by your voice. Would you like to come? Our choir practice is this night, this night. I just sort of went, not here. <laughs> you know, so I understand that sort of, you have to have, you do have to be sensitive to a balance because many times it's, um, it's frightening for people to go to a new place, right? To walk in yeah. new doors, yeah. for sure. And, and it's, not, it's not that people aren't friendly or, or want to be part of the community, but I mean, this is an example, actually, um, we, we all have to uh, watch a, uh, a training video every few years um, about um, sexual misconduct and that kind of thing, you know? Right. Uh, and I remember one of the scenarios is there's a, there's a small group, it's, it's like a prayer group or a Bible study, and um and it is the practice of everybody to hug each other when they say goodbye and there's one woman and everything in her body language is screaming don't touch me mm. right and the woman hugs her anyway so then the scenario is about what to do when when this this um uh you know breach has happened um the social and emotional breach has happened and how to address it and that's great but you can see that when someone is uncomfortable right you know and 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 so yeah you know i find that in in epiphany that that uh that people are very good at at finding just the right balance depending on the person yeah thank you that's as a member of the church i thank you for those kind words for sure <laughs> now i have an imaginary scenario for you well maybe not i don't know maybe it's happened to you before so somebody um comes to your door and they sort of like the Reader's Digest sweepstakes and says, you have won an all expenses paid trip to anywhere in the world and you can stay for as long as you want. Where would you head out first? I think London, um, England, I should say. Not that London, Ontario isn't great too. Um, <laughs> I'm very fond of, of London. It's one of my favorite cities in the world. Um, I grant you, I haven't been to all of them, um, but I, I really like it there. I have family um, living in the city and just outside of it as well. Um, I just, I like to go there. I don't know if I'd want to live there because it is, you know, it's a big, crazy, bustling city. Um, but uh, I have a lot of fondness for it. Um, my, my parents took me uh, to London for the first time uh, as a 16th birthday gift. Nice. Um, yeah, and, and it was a wonderful trip. And, um, you know, both of them said it was the, the look on my face when, when I first got there, it was worth every, you know, planning and difficulty and, and, you know, being crammed on a plane and everything, because I just uh, very much fell in love with the, the city. I mean, you know, I could say that about a lot of the, of the United Kingdom and Ireland. Scotland, yeah. um, you know, the, a lot of places there. If, if, uh, if I was allowed to, to go to several different places in the general vicinity, that's probably where I'd start to move out to. Right. Well, see, we have something else in common, my, because I have a lot of family in Britain, but my first trip to London also was when I was 16. So there we go. Wow. A, lot, <laughs> a, a fair number of years between, but, you know, still the same age of experience. <laughs> yeah. so, um, sorry, I'm just checking notes here. So the other thing I just was wondering, because I don't have a sense of where you're... Um, where your special atmosphere is for you. So if you were able to build a house anywhere you wanted, and it could be near woods or water or in a metropolis or out in the country by your, with no one around you for miles and miles, where do you think that would be for you? Where would you choose to live close to? That's a, that's a really good question. Um... You know, I'm awfully happy in the area I live in right now, I have to say. It's the Glebe, um, which is beautiful. And I'm on, the, I'm on the other side of Bronson, so the Dow's Lake side of it. Um, and so that's nice. If I want to go walk, you know, amongst trees and grass and water and that kind yeah. of thing, it's right there. And indeed, there are a lot of mature trees, and I like mature trees a lot. Um, I don't think I'd want to be you know, completely urban downtown where there's no green or, or what have you. But on the other hand, I like living in a city um, or a suburb. Um, I, I like being able to, if you want to, if you want to go out for a meal or I mean, not right now, but when we, 
yeah. <laughs> when we all come back from the war, um, you know, going to a movie, going to, you know, I, I mean, I think about, you know, if I, if I had a health issue, it's nice to be near a doctor or whatever, but that's just practical stuff. I like to be near museums and galleries and, and that kind of thing. I like, I like Ottawa a lot because you get all the benefits of a city, um, a world-class capital city, um, but it is also a very friendly city, I find, uh, especially in comparison to, you know, God bless Toronto, but it's, it's very brisk and businesslike uh, a lot of the time in personality. Um, and, and yet, you know, there's plenty of places to go if you want to be, and indeed it's not that far to go outside the city if you want it to mm -hmm. be a bit more quiet and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I've always said when we first moved here that it was, it had the big city benefits with the small town atmospheres, you know, because there's so many little villages close by or within the city itself, for sure. Nice. It's a place that I enjoy very much for what it offers as well. Um, so my last question actually is just kind of futuristic. So where would you think you might be in 10 years? Or where would you like to be? I'm not sure if they're always the same question, but. Yeah, and it's, and it's, it's so funny because none of us know when we're gonna be in six months, do we? Exactly. Um, <clears throat> we're all just sort of shrugging our shoulders like, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, parish ministry, uh, I guess is the, is the short answer. I see myself as, as working in a parish um, and uh, whether it's, uh, you know, the next parish or the one after that or, or what have you, that is, that is certainly um, something that I'm, I'm thrilled to, to continue to be doing. Good. Thanks, Alana. It's been really, really fun talking to you and taking on this new social media <laughs> role. But I, I did want to just say to you that I'm sure you know how much um, we all appreciate how hard you've worked. Um, in, in Epiphany. I mean, what a crazy, crazy couple of years to, be, you know, to be in there learning your trade, supposedly, when you jumped in, um, just completely jumped in and done such a great job. And I know on behalf of all of the parish, we just appreciate that so much about you. So thanks a lot. Thank for you. That. Jillian, thank you for telling me that. And, and that's, that goes the same for, for other people who have, have, express their if there's anybody who's who dis displeased with the job i've been doing they've been keeping their mouths shut which i appreciate <laughs> um but but thank you you know it, it it's it's so nice to to hear that from from all of you and and it's it's been fun great thanks alana thank you jillian it's been my pleasure <laughs>